Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 16. So it's really fun when you get to start to teach people, oh, there's so many more choices and you can have so much more control over your thoughts and your behaviors and your feelings than than I ever was taught, than I ever knew. Well, I am truly excited to have you back today. Our guest is Patty Davis. She is a fantastic licensed mental health counselor and she practices adventure therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical, family systems, gestalt, and play therapy with people of all ages to overcome all sorts of issues. But what we explored when you were here last time was that counselors aren't just for once we have trauma. Counselors often can be almost like um, helping us fill in the gaps in terms of our skill sets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a teenager or a parent uh, or a professional can go to a counselor to help them gain more life skills. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm yeah. re- and I'm really excited about that. So um, let's explore that a little bit because, you know, my parents always told me to just save money. I and mean, they were great with money. My mm-hmm. parents were great with money. And they just said, save money. And they never sat down and taught me the skills right like the concrete steps yeah like what would that look like because they just thought well save money i mean i save money why can't you save money right Right. or invest i mean they would save their money and then invest so their money made more money right (laughs) and and so they kind of like figured it out themselves i guess and they thought well they just need to tell me to do it and that's enough yes right yes but clearly you don't just tell someone take save money and then go invest it to make more money uh, I mean, that isn't a skill set. That is some advice. But you you actually teach the skills. Yes, exactly. So um, uh, DBT, so dialectical behavior therapy, does have um, four groups of skills to help people thrive. And so um, the first is mindfulness. So being able to be present, right? How do you when we're very anxious, that usually means our attention is too much in the future. If we're depressed, it just means that our attention is really focused in the past. And so how can you be mindful? How can you be right in this moment? Uh, The second um, set of skills have to do with distress tolerance. So how can you tolerate pain without making it worse? Uh, The third set uh, has to do with um, emotional regulation. So how do you change your feelings? You know, how, when you're feeling so anxious, what can you do about that? How can you actually make yourself feel better? Uh, and then the fourth set of skills has to do with being interpersonally effective. So what we know about relationships is that there's always a tension, like between my needs and your needs. And if you think about the, like a seesaw, healthy relationships, you're constantly getting your needs met and then sometimes it's their needs met, and then your needs met, and then their needs met. Sometimes um, we will get stuck in a pattern where either our needs never get met, and their needs always get met, and then we get resentful, or it could be the other way where we're only looking out for ourselves, and we don't really attend to others' needs. And then what's, what happens is we find that we're isolated from each other. Like we don't find that we have many friends or close relationships. So that group of skills is about how can I get my needs met? How can I say yes and no without wounding the relationship, keeping it healthy and strong? So those are all, and I tell you, they're, they're um, skills that I use every day. But I can't think of a person for which that wouldn't be helpful. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to, because, you know, there mean, is no... not, not everyone needs... You know, in the in the sort of mainstream idea of therapy, not everyone needs therapy because not everyone is depressed, right? right? But you could go to a counselor and actually sort of fill in the gaps where your parents didn't have the skills to teach you these skills. Mm-hmm. I mean, exactly. I, everyone could benefit from figuring out how to be more um, effective within their relationships and within their communication. Absolutely. And that would make life easy and more joyful right and, and healthier mm-hmm. and and it will help you get to your greater good like so if 
you know, if your goal in life, let's say you believe is to just reach your highest potential, whatever that is, and that whatever gifts you were given that you share with your community. Um, sometimes you might just come in with the, the desire to be more effective, maybe in your work or just fulfilling who you really are. And um, so, yeah, you can come into therapy so that you're thriving. You don't have to be um, sick or ill, right? Uh, it's just like you go to the dentist twice a year. Um, you know, you, you check your eyes all the time, you know, check in with a, with a therapist and see what you can learn. Right. And sometimes like you may be, um, doing really well. Like I have clients now who, um, they really did their work and they mastered the skills. And now we just touch base either when they kind of feel like things are a little bumpy or if they feel like they've lost their way, they might come in for once and then I won't see them for another three or four months. Sometimes I won't see them for a year and then they check back in and, um, so, you know, I, I love that model of therapy that, um, you know, I, I can be a, a touchstone for people and they come in, they get what they need and then they can go. And I love that too, because I mean, imagine if you had a really strong relationship with a counselor that you know is just there for you in case you need. So you, like you said, you hit a bump in the road, you know, you can go and have someone hear you and hear your, and really stand for you like um you've said in the past as an advocate to mm -hmm. hear you mm -hmm. and what's rootless um so i've done my own work and my therapist had done that for me and so you know sometimes like i wouldn't see him for like two years and then i would go back in and he knew me two years prior so he could say this is what i remember what happened about that you know I'm concerned about this or, wow, look at the growth in this area. Um, and you're right. So that's why it's very important to pick a counselor that you really trust, you really feel good in the room with. Because at best case, this is someone that will be like an advisor to you when things get a little bit bumpy and you can just go in one or two sessions and then be on sure. your way. Sure. And, you know, you look at the, the most effective people in the world all have coaches or all have they seek someone as an advisor yes. so if you want to be an effective it would be great to have a sounding board and we often will go to our friends mm -hmm. but they they're biased i remember when i was uh, making the choice whether to leave canada and move to the states or not mm. i I spoke with my friends and all of them didn't want me to go because, you know, they wanted me to stay. Right. Uh, right. So I knew that, yeah, I'm, 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 these are my sounding boards, but there's a bias here. And it would have been, uh, although I made made my choice, obviously, um, I can see that in, in certain, you know, major life decisions, when there's that fork in the road, it would be great to have a neutral sounding board that's, that's your advocate. I think that's really, the key word is neutral. So it's somebody who's outside of your like family system or outside of your community that can just see things more objectively. Um, yeah, and that is exactly the role of a, of a good therapist. All right, okay, everyone needs a therapist now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need somebody to, to um, yeah, make therapy really affordable so that everybody can go. Yeah, we all, we all need it. That's, we, need, we all need uh, access to, to uh, organic food, yes. local grown organic food. Yes, yeah, clean good water. herbs. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. To, to holistic medicine and good counselors. That's right. So that's my goal. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Now, uh, so we've spoken uh, uh, in the last uh, in the last time we had you here. We spoke about adventure therapy and play therapy. Um, what what go get into Gestalt a bit? And I and I've I've looked into Gestalt, um, but for those who don't know what it is, um, what is it, and how, how do you incorporate that into your therapy? So Gestalt is just the idea that you look at things as a whole. Um, so that, um, it is really important to, um, look at the whole picture. And so, um, you can get at things that might be bothering you in lots of different ways. So Gasalt will actually work with dreams. So do you, when you, you have all these different sort of therapies under your belt, mm -hmm. do you use them all like tools, uh, or, or do you use them one at a time? Well, so I um, initially wanted to have a breadth of 
approaches because I know that different people learn differently. Everyone has different styles. And so you want to have lots of different tools in your tool belt. Um, and so when I first started out, I did, and because I work with young kids also, you know, I do a lot of adventure and play therapy. Um, but the, the one that kind of is now emerging more for me that I find really works with lots of clients is this dialectical behavior therapy. And that's what I'm intensively trained in um, at this moment. And so I would say that is um, one of the, the major approaches that I will take with most clients. And it works really well um, for, most, for most issues. Yeah. So once... Once you have empowered someone by teaching them the skills, the DBT uh, helps them learn these life skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now they have more flexibility mm -hmm, uh, because mm -hmm. instead of sort of like being in that rut of yes. this is, this is, I'm stuck in life. This is the only things happen. This is how I react. Right. Right. And so you teach them these skills. So now they have um, more choice. Mm -hmm. Uh what what happens then do you find that just by having these skills they begin to have aha moments or begin to have you know emotional revelations or more emotional maturity or is that is that something like you teach them the skills and then when you find that they have maybe emotional stuckness that you then take out your tool belt and use other uh, therapies? Well, you know, so, um, so that's a great question. The one thing about DBT that's really different is that if you're going to do gold standard DBT, which is what we call it, um, you're going to a group once a week. So you're learning the skills more like in an educational setting. I mean, it, we make it fun, but it's it's more psychoeducational and you're in it with a group. Um, and then you're doing your individual work once a week as well. Um, and then you also get phone coaching, which means that if like let's say you're trying to learn a new skill and you are in the middle of something that's really tough and the skill isn't working or you can't find your way through, you can call the therapist and just say, look, I'm really struggling with this. Can you help me? And the DBT therapist will walk them through. I mean, it's just like a five minute coaching call. Um, but the, I think that's one of the um, reasons why DBT is so effective is because when you're struggling with something in the moment, um, you can reach out and get some support rather than having to wait a whole week. Um, and so um, so that's the components, the three components. So as someone's learning the skill, let's say let's say in group they learned the skill of um, we call it dear man, like how to make a request. And then they're in um, session with me and they're talking about, let's say I have a teen and talking about um, she wants to ask her parents something. So then I'll literally take the skill and we'll kind of grind it into her life and then we'll work together so that she feels really comfortable using the skill. And let's say, you know, five minutes after um, she leaves, she has more questions, she can just ask me. Or if she is about to go talk to her parents and she forgot something, she can check in with me. So um, I think that's really helpful because when people are trying to learn new skills, it's usually uncomfortable. You kind of, you know, you haven't mastered it yet. And so it's bumpy. And so having the therapist on the phone as support is really helpful. Yeah, that seems incredibly effective. It's like uh, a figure skater would have their coach right there watching the mistake and being like, okay, why don't you try it this way? Yeah. Uh, so you know, why, this figure skater doesn't wait a week and then the coach says, yeah, you should try it this way. Right, right. Well, and and then the other piece of it is that they're also the, the clients that are doing gold standard DBT are doing what's called a diary card. So they're writing down every day what their emotions are and what triggered the emotions so that when they come into the session with me, I have a map of like what their week looked like. Um, oftentimes, as a client, our days are so busy and our weeks go, go by so fast, we don't even remember like what happened and or like, why did that fight start again? I don't remember. And, and so, you know, I think the combination of the diary card and the phone coaching really helps people grasp skills in a way that maybe other therapies, they're not able to. I love that you you incorporate this a mini journaling. Yeah. I think people are, well, I don't know, I am, maybe not others, but 
I find journaling overwhelming. The thought of, you know, having to write um, a short story every day. It's like, when am I going to get time to do that? Right. But but if you're just like, this is what happened. This is my emotion. In naturopathic medicine, they have something called a food and mood journal, which is mm. incredibly effective. People are so unconscious. We're running around. We're super busy. Right. We're just We're just putting out fires really right we're reacting right. and yep. putting out fires and yes. we want to be better and we yes. want to be healthier yes and so if we write down everything we eat or everything goes in our mouth it can be be a piece of gum glass of water everything that goes in our mouth and how we feel in our energy level or yes. any aches and pains so i ate a donut and then 20 minutes later i feel angry um i'm i am having, you know, lower back pain mm -hmm. and I have really low energy. Yeah. And then they write these things down or I, I ate an apple and I feel refreshed and I feel happy. Right. right. And or just what's going on in the moment. And then after a week or so, they look at it or they bring it to their doctor, their naturopath, and they begin to see that, wow, every time I eat a donut, I feel crappy, you know, for the exactly. rest of the day. Whereas every time I eat apples or I eat you know, high protein and, and low refined sugar, um, I'm feeling incredibly great. And I can see a correlation between my food and my mood. And and so, if, you know, for what you were describing, if they write down what happened and how they felt about it, they can start to see, you know, they start taking responsibility for their emotions. Exactly. I think it, so the reason why like writing it down is so uh, important. One is it helps them be mindful. You know, they have to pay attention. What did happen and how did I feel? So it how, it helps you practice that skill of mindfulness at least once a day. And the diary cards are meant to be very simple. You can fill it out in, you know, three minutes, not even. Um, but then also what I'm really interested in is like, say before you ate the apple, what came up for you? What triggered that behavior? So like when, when I'm thinking about things, I think about things in terms of like a chain of events. So this led to this, led to this, led to this, led to this. So what led to eating the apple? And, and I also find that that's also helpful. Like what came just before that behavior? And then look at what came after. So, right. you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really important to understand because there is um, reinforcers that we're not even aware of. And so by slowing things down and just noticing, huh, every Thursday I get a headache. Isn't that interesting? That's the day that the piano teacher comes. Oh, mm, uh, and you know, you can just start to unpack things a little bit in a way maybe you didn't understand before. Um, and then you just have an awareness. And then with that awareness and acceptance of what is, then you can problem solve and then, you know, have other, other outcomes. I'm finding it fascinating that so much of what you're saying on the emotional mental level mm -hmm. is an exact mirror of what the naturopaths we have interviewed have said mm -hmm. about the physical health. Mm -hmm. uh, because what they, they have said, and many of them, is that I help my patients get conscious of, yeah. of what's going on unconsciously. Dr. Molly Niedermeyer said, you know, one of the first things she asks her patients is how many times do you poop? Mm, and yeah. and it's and she goes, it is amazing that we are so busy. We, we're so disconnected from our body. Absolutely. We're so disconnected sometimes from our emotions and what's why we're feeling them, what's triggering them. And and so the more and more and more we ignore or, or suppress or, or don't don't listen to our body, don't listen to our emotional body. It wants to scream at us. Right. It's a vessel. Our body is a vessel sometimes. And so if you're not paying attention, you know, it'll do something to get your attention. Um, and so um, the thing I also think that's interesting about the body is, again, now, so this is my perspective, but the I believe that there's this flow that if you have a thought, then that leads to a feeling and then the feeling leads to a behavior often. So that's like the way things go. Um, and that's why it's important that you have high quality thoughts because a positive high quality thought will lead to more positive feelings. And then if you're feeling better, your behaviors will be you know, more balanced and, and healthier, correct? But what we also know is that the reverse is true. So let's say I'm feeling just really down. If I do the behavior of like, let's say I force myself to take a walk. If I change my behavior, then I will feel better. And then when I feel better, my thoughts thoughts tend to be of higher quality. So you can kind of 
change how you feel either by addressing your thoughts or you can also sometimes just behave in ways that will allow you to then feel better. And I, I just love that you can actually start to have this understanding like, um, I have more control over my body and my mood than I ever understood. And I can actually pause, like a lot of people don't understand that when you have an urge, an urge is energy, correct? Most people believe you have to follow the urge. Well, in fact, that's not the case. When you feel the urge, you then have two choices. You can follow the energy or you can pause and stay and just let the energy run through you. Um, so it's really fun when you get to start to teach people, oh, there's so many more choices and you can have so much more control over your thoughts and your behaviors and your feelings than, than I ever was taught, than I ever knew. A lot of us were raised to believe that, you know, in society and mainstream media, that being in victim mode is sort of the way to go. Mm. And, um, and so it just, you know, it speaks to that we're all unconscious, we're running around, we're putting out fires, we're busy, we're on the go, we go to Starbucks, we get our coffee, you know, we're driving our kids to school, we're yeah. and it's like, we don't, pause like so many so many of these doctors we've interviewed uh, they suggest everyone meditate just like five yeah. minutes a day just or meditate. those float pods you know where, where they've <laughs> yeah. got those desensitization pods i think yep. i haven't tried them but i've heard yeah that we get so distracted we're so out of our bodies that but I, and when i've talked to people about this this idea of being in victim mode mm. um thing it's like things are happening to me you know, he yeah. said that to me. Yeah. He made me feel this. Yeah. Yes. And their languaging is all like pointing at them. Like the world is doing things to them yeah. or that even groups of people do things to them. Those though that my family makes me feel. Yeah. And so in the languaging, uh, which is part, you know, part expression of our thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. It is in this mode of I am helpless. Correct. Uh, I don't have, um, I'm, very, I'm not at cause in my world. Right. I don't have an effect on my world. Right. And things happen to me. Yes. And so many, I, I, I mean, I can relate because I'm a woman. So many women feel this way. I'm sure men do too. Mm. Um, but we are taught to be in victim mode. Right. More passive. That, that um, rather than being active and understanding that we actually can, uh, we have control over some things, not everything but we do have control over some things. Um, and it's that idea, you know, the serenity prayer, like um, that you can kind of um, accept the things you can't change, change the things that you can and have the wisdom to know the difference. And so- And not take any of it personally. Right, right. Um, and it's, it is interesting. So when clients come into the, into the office that struggle in, in their interpretations of how things are happening. You know, part of my work is to help them understand that they are at this moment in a passive stance and that passive stance gets them these outcomes. And if they want to continue to have those outcomes, then stay in a passive stance. If you want a different outcome, then there are other stances you could take. For example, a more active, which means you're going to have to maybe interpret things differently, behave differently. Um, but it's all about sometimes just awareness. Some people just haven't thought of themselves as being very passive. And so if you kind of point it out to them in a kind way, in a loving way, you know, um, then you can say, so, you know, there's lots of choices here. Being passive is one, but there's many others. Do you want to try another one? I mean, you've got the passive one down, Pat. You're really, you've got that mastered. So, you know, what about trying something else? Um, and I think that that, you know, when people understand that they are more powerful than they realize, that's when they start to get engaged. And that's when life gets fun. It's like, what can I create? What can I do? You know, I can't, I can't control everything. I can't control the weather. I can't control, you know, lots of things. But there, the things that I can control what am I going to do? And let's make it fun. I'm just curious. Let's have fun with it. What can I do? What exercise would uh, could you give our listeners to um, become more empowered in their life, to be at cause in their life? Mm. Great question. I think probably the simplest, most powerful thing is to watch your language 
and that you are going to start speaking from an I standpoint. So I feel this, I did this rather than she pissed me off. (laughs) You know, he did this to me or they did this to me that you're coming from. I felt upset when you didn't do that Uh, because what what's helpful to remember is that the only person that has access to your internal world is you. So um, oftentimes clients, partners, people tend to either mind read or I'm sure she thinks I'm an idiot or, you know, or they just hate me. Well, you have no idea what's happening for them internally. The only person that you know about is your own. So you have to speak what you know is to be true, which is what you know is going on with you. So just even taking that that shift of um, I, you know, starting things with I, I think that's helpful. Oh, another really easy one that I like a lot, it's um, oftentimes people will say, um, yeah, like it pissed me off, but I'm okay with it. Like they say two different things and there's always that the word but is in the middle and uh, switching the word but for and is very powerful because it means that both are true. So I am pissed off and I'm okay with it that acknowledging both as human beings, we struggle with this idea that things that are seemingly opposite can both be true, but it's in fact the case. Um, I love the example of like a parent can be gentle and firm at the same time. And a lot of parents, and I'm a parent, so I include myself, struggle with, I can either be like really, really kind and gentle, or I can be harsh, like, you know, that, but they're exclusive, they're mutually exclusive. And so the idea that you can be both. Um, so I like using the word and, and using the word I as two language changes. I'm going to try that. That's another writer downer, people. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So you've given us a lot of great uh, tools. Thank you uh, in this episode and in the last time that we uh, sat down together. Our listeners are really busy people on the go. I know that stress is a, a big factor in that affects. We, we all can agree that stress, emotional stress, mm-hmm. mental stress mm-hmm. can affect our physical health. Absolutely. What tool or tip or some advice you can give us to help us manage our stress? So the the free easiest tip that I have is to breathe. When we're under a lot of stress, we breathe shallowly. And what happens is then we're breathing shallowly, our brain then gets anxious because it's like I'm not getting enough oxygen, I'm not getting enough oxygen, what's happening? And so Um, when we notice that we're under some stress, even if you can, uh, be mindful and just notice your breath, or sometimes I'll do something like I will bring myself back to my body and be mindful by washing my hands, like in cold water, or I might smell something like lavender just to kind of bring me back. Because when you're in the present moment, um, it just helps to bring down your anxiety. And when your anxiety is down, then you can think more clearly. So breathing is free. It's with you all the time, right? Um, So just to be thoughtful of um, the easiest one that you can do is just in your head, you're telling yourself, you know, um, I'm breathing in. I know I'm breathing in. And then as you exhale, I'm breathing out. I know I am breathing out. And you just repeat that as you're breathing in. I know I am breathing in. And then as you exhale, I'm breathing out. I know I am breathing out. And it just grounds you. And when you get very grounded, then the stress goes down. Uh, it balances your your brain. Uh, so you're not as emotional. You can bring your logic more on board and then... Uh, So yeah, in terms of a stress, a way to cope with stress, just breathe. Breathing is good. Yeah, it's free. It's free. (laughs) Everyone can do it. It costs nothing. (laughs) Deep breaths, people. Yes. 
What book would you recommend our listeners read or listeners who are interested in, in, in emotional mental health and, mm-hmm. and also uh, in whole, you know, they're holistic minded. Uh, what book would you recommend? Wow. Well, the one that I, I love uh, personally, and I recommend a lot, and it's written by a Buddhist nun, Pema Chodron, um, When Things Fall Apart. I love that. It's about grief and loss and how to bear pain skillfully. It has a very um, Buddhist take, but I, well, and I found it very helpful um, for people who are looking for something, let's see, that might not have that uh, Buddhist flavor. I'm just trying to think of what's on my bookshelf right now that I love. Um Laura Kastner has several books out that are good for parents. Um, and I think they're, I think her latest one, she actually wrote, I believe, with Marsha Lenahan. Um, it's very informed by DBT. I think it's called The Wise-Minded Parent. But anything by Laura Kastner I really like. It's the idea that uh, as a parent, you want to be as balanced as you can be before you either interact with your child or before you make any decisions. And so I love that one as well. Fantastic. Now, if someone's interested after hearing this in finding a DVT counselor, Mm -hmm. uh, what's the best resource to find one that that is accredited? Sure, actually. So um, Behavioral Tech is a website um, that you can go to. So it's uh, behavioraltech.com. And um, you can just put in your zip code and that will give you lists in all the states of uh, DBT therapists that are intensively trained. So they have gone through like rigorous, rigorous training by Marsha Lenahan. And so you can be assured that they are very, very good at what they do. Um, And what you want to ask if you're looking for a DBT therapist is, you know, are they gold standard? which means do they provide groups? Do they do individual therapy? Do they do phone coaching? And are they part of a consult team? Because what we know is, you know, being a therapist, you really need to keep yourself balanced as well. And you need to be surrounded by good people who can also see things that maybe you would miss. So, you know, if you're looking for a a really strong DBT therapist, ask those questions for, you know, do they do groups, individual, phone coaching and are they in a consult thank you that that's great i'm our listeners uh now know where to go and uh so what was that website again yeah it's uh behavioral tech behavioral tech yeah okay and um probably can google it exactly yeah yeah and there'll be a there's a part in the website where it says like how to find a um, therapist near you and that's yeah excellent resource and if you're in seattle you need to come to patty (laughs) <laughs> absolutely absolutely yes For sure. now patty you know you we were talking before the interview about uh you know you're very healthy you you know you're obviously very emotionally and mentally healthy um our, our listeners are, are keen on learning what other people do to maintain uh, their optimal health mm. what do you what do you do to maintain your health you know well we already know emotionally and mentally well, what do you do to maintain your health uh physically and spiritually uh, great question. So, you know, and I do want the listeners to be aware I have done my own work and I continue to do my own work. I mean, I think that a therapist who doesn't do their own therapy, I'm, I'm concerned, I guess. So, you know, I, I really do do my own work. Um, so physically I eat v- very clean. I would say 90% of the time. Um, so that means that, you know, whole foods and nothing processed. I don't do the gluten anymore. I'm really, I'm not doing alcohol. Um, and so I eat very clean. I do supplements because that helps me. So I really do use things like St. John's wort, um, and, um, B complex when I'm under a lot of stress. Exercise for me, I feel very strong emotionally when I'm strong physically. So I like to do Pilates for my core. Um, I play tennis because I just love it. Um, so keep my heart strong. Uh, and let's see, spiritually, I'm part of a, a woman's spiritual group. That really helps me to look at the bigger picture and to find meaning in things. Um, and so that's been a very helpful thing I've done in the last year. Um, that helps keep me grounded as well. So I have to work at it as well. And when a piece falls off, 
I notice it and I don't feel as um, healthy. And so then I have to pick it back up. Like, so for my, my coach, my tennis coach was out of town for a little bit. And so for about six weeks, eight weeks, I wasn't playing tennis. And you know what? I could tell my, my attention, my mood wasn't as good. And so now I'm back and, you know, but I have to just work at it like everybody else. Those are all great tips uh, that you, when you're not feeling, you know, your optimal, go out and see what you can do to balance yourself emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Absolutely. Oh, and the one thing I didn't mention was sleep. I really think sleep is so restorative and um, that if you're not getting really uh, good quality sleep, I would look at that because that's when your body does a lot of repair and, um, so if you're noticing that you're not getting enough sleep, try to figure out what the barriers are and see if you can increase the hours that you get. I am wholeheartedly right there with you, especially with a 10-month-old. Yes. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> sleep when the baby sleeps. <laughs> it's exactly right. Exactly right. Now, our listeners are on the cutting edge of holistic health science. Today, you can set the record straight by busting a health myth. So it could be mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health. What is a health myth that you can bust for listeners today? An example would be like aluminum doesn't really cause Alzheimer's and eating eggs is actually good for you. <laughs> what is a myth? Um, I guess one of the myths that people come in with are I can't control how I feel. You know, so if I feel depressed, I have to stay depressed. I mean, I just can't do anything about it. Or if I feel anxious, I, I just, there's nothing I can do about it. Clients, I believe in the, the biosocial um, theory. So biology has a lot to do with our temperament. And some of us feel more anxiety than others. Some of us are more prone to depression than others. Um, that being said, um, the only way to decrease anxiety is to expose yourself to it over and over and over again. Um, and so you just have to know that if you're, if you're anxious about like, let's say public speaking, the only way to, to get over that is to expose yourself and you can do it in very small little increments, watch other people public speak or, um, you know, maybe just do like an introduction to a speech. Um, but so, yeah, that's one of the biggest myths that people really don't understand how, how much control they have over their mood and their feelings. And through the therapy that you do, people will learn quickly. how, yeah, they'll learn how to first notice what is, what's showing up. And then we do what's called opposite action. So let's say I'm feeling really, really depressed and I'm in bed and I know that this is the third day and I'm going to feel a lot of shame and guilt. Uh, and things are going to get worse, then I need to do opposite action. So I have to do opposite of what my body is kind of maybe ha thinking I want to do so that I feel better, so that you can actually shift out of that. So like go to the gym. That's right. <laughs> or at least just get up out of bed. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, so it's just opposite action. And sometimes you really do need to use opposite action as a way to help yourself. It's hard. It get, it, in the short term, it's harder, but in the long term, it's much easier, much healthier, as opposed to the opposite, which is when you're depressed and in the short term, it feels good to lay in bed, but in the long term, it's really to your detriment. So it's, it's kind of like shifting in your thought about thinking, I understand in the short term, but what about the long term? You've given us so much. I'm going to ask for one more thing, to throw the gauntlet down for our listeners. What is a challenge that you can give all of us for the next seven days? to improve something in our life, our health, emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually? What's a challenge that we can do every day for the next seven days? The one that I like the best is every morning and every night, think of 10 things for which you are grateful. Because what we know is that when you're feeling gra gratitude, you can't feel anxiety. Or when you're feeling gratitude, you don't feel depression. And uh, looking for reasons that you are grateful helps you clean up your filter. Some of us get really, really just focus on what's not working. And so I would challenge people to look for what they are thankful for, look for what they are grateful for, do it morning and night for seven days in a row and see if that doesn't help them shift. And in the beginning, it might be hard. In the beginning, you might be like, I can only get to six. <laughs> um, but it can be very, very small. I'm grateful for this chair that's holding me up. I'm grateful for my, my warm boots. You know, so that's, I would, I would love to challenge your listeners to do that. All right. 
the gauntlet has been thrown. Absolutely. Seven days of gratitude. Yes. Let's all do it together. Yes. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Patty Davis, uh, for coming and um, really enlightening us and giving us a lot of fantastic tools. Um, I am grateful that uh, you were here today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And for our listeners who are in the local area or know someone in Seattle and want to um, see you for, for sessions, uh, just let them know what is the what is the best way they can reach you. Sure. So my office is actually in Bellevue. And um, they can call me. My phone number is 206-321-5003. They can email patty p-a-t-t-i dot davis d-a-v-i-s at comcast.net or they can look under psychology today and type in my name and they can see my bio there awesome thank you so much and um i'm again grateful <laughs> i am absolutely grateful that you're here today absolutely thank you it was my pleasure how would you like to learn from top naturopathic physicians? Go to freedoctorcourse.com and sign up for the free course that'll email you videos with tips and tricks to achieving optimal health. That's freedoctorcourse.com, freedoctorcourse.com.